Has anybody in the room ever felt like, yeah, I, I wish my body was different? Yeah, me too. I wish I had a full head of hair. I wish I was a little taller. When I was a kid, I wish I could run faster. I wish I was better in some sports. I wish I played my trumpet better. I mean, there are a lot of things. I wish God had gifted me differently than what he gave me. But this is the body that he gave me. And that's the body that he gave you. But let's not, let's not say, oh, I've always felt home in my body. Every one of us, our body tells us that this world is broken. And the older you get, the more you feel it every day, right? The pain, after 50, the pain just moves. You never, the pain never leaves. It just moves throughout your body. But every one of us, our bodies are broken. Every one of us points within us and says, something's not right. And that is, that is true. Now times that by 10, times that by 100. And that's what a person feels like who feels like God made a mistake. Have you ever felt that way? I feel like God made a mistake. So today, my goal, my prayer, I know it's a difficult challenge and I will fall short, but it's to offer hope and clarity. It's not to disparage, it's not to attack or demean anyone. That is not what we're to be known for, but it's to speak truth with grace. And wherever you are in your faith journey, you are welcome here. And I believe it's our posture that we wanna help in whatever you're going through. Thank you and all the women who've put a lot of work and preparation and planning for that, for that weekend. My name is Kyle, and I'm the pastor here. And if you're a guest with us, really glad that you've chosen to be with us. Uh, you've chosen to be with us in the middle of a series called Jesus And, as we're looking at current cultural topics and issues. Uh, we believe Jesus has a word to say, and his word is always better than the world's word. And so... As we go through this series, just to keep in mind, the first weekend, we set the foundation, and we talked about the kingdom of man, the kingdom of God, because that dictates how we think about every issue that you and I are ever faced with on this side. And the kingdom of man says, I decide who I am and what I get to do. And the kingdom of God says, God has the authority to tell me what to do, and I submit to that. And every issue we face falls into one of those two categories. You have the decision to make. Am I going to follow the kingdom of God or am I going to follow the kingdom of man? I'm going to invite you to pray with me as we discuss a sensitive subject today as we look at Jesus and gender. Would you join me in prayer? So Father, we recognize here this morning that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with principalities and spirits of this age and we need your help because we cannot defeat the spirit of this age apart from you. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak powerfully in this room. You would convict where we need to be convicted. We would uh, be encouraged where we need the word of God to encourage us this morning. I pray for those within our church body and family that this is an area of struggle for them. I pray our response would be one of truth, but also one of grace as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have a Bible, we'll be looking at uh, the early part of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Uh, I want to define a few things for us today. There may be some of you in the room who are like, why are we even talking about this subject? Like, really? Do we need to talk? I thought the same thing. And when I was in seminary, never did I dream I'd have to be doing a sermon on gender, right? But if you're in the room and you're in the position where this has never been a factor in your life, you don't know anybody who struggled with this, I'm just going to ask that you bring a little humility to the conversation and that you would seek to understand. As believers, we need to think critically about current topics, but we also need to seek to understand. We've been saying every week, I see you, I empathize with you. So that to empathize means there needs to be a certain amount of understanding. And the third one is, I'm here to help you. And so I would ask for that. There are people within our church who have family members, who have children, who have grandchildren, who have had these conversations with them to say, hey, I know I was raised as your daughter, but now I'd like to be your son, or vice versa, or uncles, or aunts, or grandchildren. So this is a very relevant 
subject. And the question is, we need to know, how do I respond? How do I follow Jesus and honor God and at the same time be, be honest and, and be gracious too? It's a legitimate question and something we need to wrestle with. Mark Yarhouse, there's a a book in your resources there in your program. Every week on a topic, we're providing resources. And those resources for those watching online are listed in the YouTube notes of every week's sermon. If you missed a a week, you can go back and look. I'm going to hold the Jesus and series or maybe another topic in a year from now that we need to address as a church. And we want to, what does Jesus have to say on this subject? I mean, that's the reality. There'll be things that the world throws at us in a year or two that we don't even know what that'll be. But listen, God word, God's word will give us direction in how to respond. But Mark Yarhouse, he does a lot of writing on this subject. Let me give you a few uh, definitions of some terms that we'll refer to here today. And it is a PG-13 message, so I'll defer to the parents on that. Um, Mark Yarhouse, transgender, the term, it's an umbrella term in the many ways that people might experience and or present and express and live out their gender identities differently from the sense of the people who live differently from their biological sex. So so transgender is this really big umbrella. Non-binary simply refers to not male and not female. Gender dysphoria, you're hearing that more and more. It's a psychological term for the distress a person has when their internal feelings do not match up with their biological sex tells them they are. Now, in a very small number of cases, there are people in the United States, around the world, who are born with multiple sexual organs that identify with both. I'm not addressing that here today. That's a very small percentage, and how we're to address that would would be similar, with grace and compassion. But today, I'm talking about, more broadly, the transgender topic. To transition, if you've heard somebody say transition, there's three steps when somebody says, I'm going to transition. The first is social. I'm going to tell my family. I'm going to tell my coworkers. I'm going to begin to dress a certain way. It's social. The second is hormonal. It might be for children, puberty blockers. or There might be testosterone or estrogen, right? They're going to take that. That's the second step. And the third step is, is surgical. Gender... The term gender, psychological, social, and cultural aspects of being male or female. It's been said in some of my readings, it's described this as a crass way to describe it, that sex, gender, oftentimes, uh, biological sex is, is what's between your legs, but gender is what's between your ears. And so there's, in culture today, they're saying, well, I know I was born this way, but that's not what I feel. I feel like this, but my body tells me this. Now, let me, let me just, can we all just have compassion for a moment here as we dive into this? Have you ever felt like you're not at home in your body? Now, let's, let's be honest. Has anybody in the room ever felt like, yeah, I, I wish my body was different? Yeah, me too. I wish I had a full head of hair. I wish I was a little taller. When I was a kid, I wish I could run faster. I wish I was better in some sports. I wish I played my trumpet better. I mean, there are a lot of things. I wish God had gifted me differently than what he gave me. But this is the body that he gave me. And that's the body that he gave you. But let's not, let's not say, oh, I've always felt home in my body. Every one of us, our body tells us that this world is broken. And the older you get, the more you feel it every day, Right? The pain, after 50, the pain just moves. You never, the pain never leaves. It just moves throughout your body. But every one of us, our bodies are broken. Every one of us points within us and says, something's not right. And that is is true. Now times that by 10, times that by 100. And that's what a person feels like, who feels like God made a mistake. Have you ever felt that way? I feel like God made a mistake. So today, my goal, my prayer, I know it's a difficult challenge and I will fall short, but it's to offer hope and clarity. It's not to disparage, it's not to attack or demean anyone. That is not what we're to be known for, but it's to speak truth with grace. And wherever you are in your faith journey, you are welcome here. And I believe 
It's our posture that we want to help, whatever you're going through. 5.6% of U.S. adults identify as LGBT. Five years ago, it was 4.5%. However, Generation Z, it's 16 16%. That's a dramatic increase. And if you, if you compare it to some other uh, groups of people that have fought for rights, I'm not comparing these, but just from a time perspective, women's rights, that was a 100-year battle. Civil rights, over a 100-year battle within our nation. This has happened in my lifetime, much less in my lifetime. The word gay wasn't even mentioned when I was in high school. Justice Scalia, in writing the dissent in the Supreme Court decision in 2015, in which the Supreme Court made gay marriage the law of the land in every state, he wrote in the dissent, this is a very slippery slope. For once we redefine marriage as it has been defined for centuries, we will now begin to redefine gender. That was 2015. We're not even 10 years from that. And, and look where we are. Miley Cyrus, didn't think I'd ever be quoting Miley Cyrus in a sermon. She says, I don't relate to being a boy or girl and I don't have to have my partner relate to being a boy or girl. Brown University study, which has been suppressed by the LGBT community, says rapid onset of gender dysphoria among teens and young adults may be a social contagion linked with having friends and family members who identify with the LGBT. As identity politics, peer culture, and an increase in internet use. Let me give you an example. The largest group demographic that's transitioning right now are white teenage girls living on the West Coast. 80% of new candidates for sexual reassignments. That is a definition of a social contagion. When my friend in third grade says, I'm gay, and it's celebrated, what other third grade student wouldn't want to be identified that way as well? As a social contagion. Sam Alberry, who writes a lot on this subject, also says, our culture says your psychology determines your sexual identity. Let your body be conformed to it. The Bible says your body is your sexual identity. Let your mind be conformed to it. See, God's word creates, and man affirms what God creates. Man doesn't create anything. You and I have never created anything in our life. We might build, we might make things, but we've never created life. God does that. Over the past few years, a transgender tsunami has swept our nation. Sharon James writes, this challenge to the man-woman blueprint, which lies in the foundation of family and society, is unprecedented. An example of this, I don't know if you knew that, the third Wednesday in October is Personal Pronouns Day. I'm sorry. It's celebrated as International Pronouns Day. If you work in the corporate world, some of you are retired, and so you're not aware of what's happening. In the corporate world today, this is, this is something that followers of Jesus wrestle with every day from diversity training to LinkedIn having to refer to people by how they're asking to be referred to. When I grew up, there were two genders. There are now approximately 72 genders at last count. The American College of Pediatricians says this. That's a secular article. Conditioning children into believing a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonations of the opposite sex, saying that it is normal and healthful, is child abuse. I've heard it said like this, changing gender is a short-term gain with long-term pain. But according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, I did a little, I went into places I usually don't go to for research on this sermon which is the standard in the industry, it says as many as 98% of gender-confused boys and 85% of gender-confused girls eventually accept their biological sex after naturally passing through puberty. Parents in the room and grandparents, 
parents in the room, if you have children, parent. Parent your kids. Speak truth to them. Point them to God's word. Point them to the fact that God created them with a purpose. Lovingly be proactive in this, not reactive to it. Because if you don't, somebody else will. Grandparents, don't forsake your responsibility either. To, to point them to God's word, to point them to the beautiful reality that God created them. It is no longer an out there issue, it is an in here issue as well. And gender studies uh, really began in academia, as most of these issues began, universities and academia, and it's where many followers of Jesus professors have fled, they've left the universities. And so if you are in that context, uh, I will pray for you. You are needed in the university to speak truth to young adults. If you are in the education field, uh, you're needed. I know the difficulty. I speak with teachers who are I'm trying to honor God and follow Jesus. I'm trying to, to be a good teacher as well and do what the school's asking me to do. That is a really difficult place. What's happening in school? school classrooms all across the country or they're taking teachers are being told to take children on gender adventures. And so if you are a teacher, I will pray for you. And what you do is really important. Thank you for what you do. I'm grateful for you. What we've told children for, for decades is be you. Live your truth. Whoever you want to be, you can become. And now that has come to fruition. But the takeaway today, and I'll repeat this, who I am determines whose I am. And whose I am determines who I am. God determines who I am. And there's things about my body I wish would change. And Christians tend to downplay the body, but throughout Scripture, the body is actually really important. You're going to be with your body for eternity. I'm hoping we get the upgraded version. <laughs> right? But God, bodies are really important. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he tells us that our bodies don't ultimately belong to us. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So therefore, glorify God with your body. That tells me there's a way I cannot glorify God with my body. We've talked about that through this series. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. This is the 30,000 foot view of creation. 26, Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. There's only one being that can use plural, plural nouns, and that is God. God created using the Trinity. He says, us, he's talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You, it took all of Trinity to create you and our likeness and let them have dominion over the fields of the seas and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, foundational text. So God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Created is used three times. In that one verse, anytime God's word repeats itself, pay attention. When it repeats itself twice, it's really, really important. Created three times. Who created? Did man create? Man didn't create. God created man. You and I don't, don't create. We affirm what God created. I affirm your identity, your gender, and you affirm mine as created by God. God gave mankind a job to do. Gave us a purpose, uh, male and female. What does it mean to be male and female? When we were going through politics, we had a government 101 class in case you missed that day in freshman year of high school. So just for a moment, let's go to biology 101. What does it mean to be male and female? We have different reproductive organs. I don't need to spell that out for you here today. Different external anatomy. Number three, endocrine hormonal system. Estrogen for women, testosterone 
for men. They're secondary characteristics. Women have breasts and they have wider hips, right, for, for childbearing. Males, denser muscle mass and the ability to grow facial hair. There's a lot of characteristics that if men and women are designed differently. There's 500 things my wife can do that I can't do. Probably more than that, but at least 500. There's some things I can do that my wife can't do, and that's how God designed it. Man and woman were created with equal value with different roles. Equal value, different roles. We're very different. When you go through the creation account, the phrase according to its kind or according to their kind is used 10 different times to indicate there are separate species and genders which are distinct and different. Now, I wonder what Adam was thinking. He's naming all these animals. All these animals have male and female. He's like, where's mine? Who's for me? It's not the hippopotamus. It's not the koala bear, right? He's like, where, where's mine? In addition, the word separate is used five times in the first chapter and it means to set apart. This is a word of distinction or differentiation. The creation account in Genesis shows how God separated many things. He separated the light from the darkness. He separated the waters above from the waters below. He separated the dry land from the waters below. He separated the day from the night. He separated male and female. That's what he did. He, se- he created them and he separated them. So in a very narrow sense, it's a very narrow definition of male and female according to the Bible. But then that looks so different. Biblical manhood is, is a very wide definition. And biblical womanhood is a very wide definition within what it means to be a female. I have three daughters. They're all very different. I praise God for them. What it means to be a man looks different. There are godly men in this room who all have very different characteristics and likes and hobbies and interests. So let's not be so narrow in our definition of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. To be a woman does not just simply mean to be prim and proper and to bake cookies in the kitchen. That is not what God's word says a woman is. Just like what it, the God's word does not say a man has to go hunting and throw axes and eat meat all day. Have you ever been in an environment where you felt like, I don't fit in at a women's gathering or a men's gathering? I know nothing about cars. If I go to a car show, I am a fish out of water. I I just know, I just need a car that gets me from point A to point B. I know how to put gas in it. If I had to, I could change the oil, put some tires on it, change the battery. I couldn't tell a V8, right, from a horse. Does that make me less of a man? Women, you've been in environments. Where you're, you're, every, all the women are doing the same thing. You're like, man, I, is there something wrong with me that I'm, I'm not like all these other women? So the danger and the caution to the church is that we not be so specific in defining what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Your goal and my goal, according to the Bible, is not to be more of a man or more of a woman. It's to be more like Christ. Make your focus to be transformed to the image and the person of Christ. And your womanhood and your manhood will play out in that. But don't apologize for who God made you, for the interests that you have. I mean, David, my goodness, was a musician and wrote, all of the Psalms. He was a poet. Did that make him less of a man? He's a man after God's own heart. Oh, by the way, he was also a warrior and a king, but a musician and a poet. The Proverbs 31 woman. I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible passage women to aspire to. A woman who takes care of her household, but then goes out and is an entrepreneur and does business in the streets and takes from her profit and gives to the poor. But then you have pictures of women like Deborah, a violent judge in the Old Testament. Don't mess with her, right? And so sometimes we get into trouble when we categorize that men and women have to look a certain way. And if you've ever not felt welcome in a church based on your gender, I'm sorry for that. Because what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman is so much bigger and and broader. And you look at the person of Jesus 
Yes, he flipped some tables and he carried a whip that day. But he was also a man who wept and grieved. He shed tears. He was a man who was willing to cry. And he hugged lepers. And he let little children come and sit on his lap. I picture him singing songs with them and doing hand motions with them. But he was also a man who was whipped and beaten. He's the greatest man who's who's ever walked our planet. Genesis chapter 2, it goes into more detail of this creation account. In verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be made alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no helper fit for him. So Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into the woman, brought her to the man. Then he said, Adam's like, finally. There's a joke here about Whoa, man, woman, literally. He looked at her and said, whoa, man. That's where we get the name woman. I didn't use that the first hour, and I shouldn't have used it second hour. (laughs) This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, for she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Men, aren't you grateful God made two sexes? I am. I'm so grateful. He didn't have to do that. That's a sign of his goodness. He's a great God. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. What's happening here in the garden is this picture. What's being described, the rib coming out of the side of man, is actually the term for temple. You have Adam and Eve perfectly in this perfect environment, shoulder to shoulder, they're side by side, and they're representing the glory of God as a temple does. What's the purpose of a temple or a tabernacle is to display the holiness and the glory of God here on earth. That was what Adam and Eve were doing. And Paul picks up on that theme later on in Ephesians when he talks about the essence of the gospel is the husband and wife coming together. It's a picture of the gospel lived out Two, becoming, becoming one. It's a beautiful picture. Two, two sexes. And we take this text and in the culture and we, we let, in the culture in which we live. Today or tomorrow morning, if you turn on PBS or another children's program, there are over 70 children's programs pushing over 259 characters that are varied in gender. And these shows are like Blue's Clues and My Little Ponies and Clifford the Big Red Dog. It used to be Mr. Potato Head, now it's just Potato Head. Transgender agenda. Educators are encouraged to take kids on a gender adventure. And kids can change names without parental consent. And there are states in our country that at 15, they can actually change gender without notifying parents. There's an enemy whose sole goal is to confuse our kids so they will not know their purpose. Parents, teach your children that whose they are determines their identity. God determines their identity. We don't get to choose that. Now, male and female, it says in this text, were created for reproduction. If you have the ability, parents, mom and dad, to have children, have children. It's a blessing. One of the best things you can do on this planet It's to raise a child and point them to their creator and point them, help them find their purpose. Have children, reproduction. One of the best things you can give society is a child or or a baby. Every aspect of God's image is reflected in, in women and every aspect of God's image is represented in men. Now, just to break this down a little bit, every human cell has around six feet of DNA. DNA is a fairly recent discovery, right? I mean, in my lifetime, 
We've learned a lot about DNA. Let's say each human has around 10 trillion cells. That's a low ballpark number. That would mean that each person has around 60 trillion feet or around 10 billion miles of DNA inside of them. 10 billion miles of DNA specifically found in you. And that includes your gender. A child doesn't know what is the best snack to eat or what their bedtime should be. They shouldn't be deciding what their gender is. Parents, parent, speak truth to your kids. Of course they're going to have questions and they're not going to feel like they fit in or feel like something's wrong. Yeah, we've all been there. We've all gone through the middle school years and felt like we didn't fit in and felt like my body's not right and all these things. Lead them. Lead them with grace. Kira Bell, in a book called Embodied by uh, Preston Sprinkle, there's a... Uh, a testimony in there. She transitioned at age 14 from female to male. The further my transition went, the more I realized I wasn't a man and I never would be. As I matured, I realized gender dysphoria was an overall a symptom, not a cause. Where were the adults? <coughs> to tell me this was not the right time to make this decision. Part of being a parent is walking with our children through difficult times instead of giving them whatever it is they want or think they need in the moment. The best thing we can do for our kids sometimes is to tell them no. This matters. This, uh, this topic matters, and it's, it's important as we wrestle with family members and uh, grandchildren who are exploring all of this. Jesus speaks about gender in Matthew 19, verse 4. This is the Jesus and series, so what does Jesus have to say on gender? Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He said similar in Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Gnosticism, which was a early first century heresy that showed up in the church, believed that the body was bad, but all that really matters was the mind. It's similar today, right? It's not what my body says. It's what I want it to be. It's what I think it should be. And it's having compassion and empathy to walk alongside somebody who literally feels like God made a mistake when he created me. And our job is to, with empathy and compassion to speak truth to them, say, oh no, God hasn't done that. I love you, but more than that, God loves you. And he has a purpose for you. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Here we see God prohibits the blurring of gender identity. And if you say, well, that's the Old Testament, Paul repeats that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when he's talking to the church in Corinth, which is doing awful things. There are male prostitutes that are infiltrating the church. And the definition of male prostitute is men who are dressing in drag in church. It's clear from Scripture, it's one big reason the drag queen story hour has no place in schools or libraries. Isaiah 45 verse 9 in the New Living Translation says, What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Have you ever argued with your creator? Have you ever wrestled with God? Isaiah says that's, we should grieve that. And we should grieve that in our own life when we've called, out, called God into question over what he's done and why he made me the way he made me. Here's the rest of the verse. Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it saying, stop, you're doing it all wrong? No, we don't, we don't get to do that. We trust in the God that who created us and who formed us and he is still molding and shaping us. And the key word today is not transitioning, it's transforming. You and I, the world's going to tell us that it's outside in. You change the outward appearance and then I'll feel all better about who I am as a person. Listen, suicide rates are much higher for those who've completed the trans journey. 
once they've arrived at the place of feeling like I now am who I want to be, they're still lost and broken because their greatest need is not a surgery. Their greatest need is Jesus. And your greatest need is not what this world has to offer. It's Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can solve the gender issue in our country. It's the gospel that says, I am broken. Everything about me is broken. And every minute I live in this world, I recognize more and more that this world is broken. It's all around us. And the only answer is the gospel. It's the gospel. So how do we respond? We respond with truth. We respond with grace. Biblical biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. I I had a difficult conversation a number of years ago with a with a man who was transitioning to be a woman. And his again, his greatest need wasn't hormone therapy and it wasn't a surgery. It was uh, I knew, I had gotten to know this individual, and these are really uncomfortable conversations for me, if I can just be honest with you. When I sit down at the barber and somebody who's in transition comes to cut my hair, I ask God for grace and wisdom and give me words to say, because I got nothing. And I only have two minutes at the barber. It doesn't take very long. It's hard. When your barista's got, you're like, do you say yes, sir, yes, ma'am? I don't know. These are, it's uncomfortable and it's hard. But ask God for mercy and grace to treat them as Jesus treats them. And to speak truth, I remember sitting with this individual and his greatest problem was that he had never been told no in his entire life. He was a middle-aged man living with his mother and, and that, I felt like that was my job. So I said, may I be honest with you? Can I, Dustin, Dustina, I said, can I, can I be honest with you? I said, you're a man. God made you a man. He made you with purpose. He has a plan for your life. Those are uncomfortable conversations. I don't go seeking those out. But this Thanksgiving, they might come to your table, this family Thanksgiving. You might have already had them with family and friends, and it'd be easy to either say, I'm just going to set up boundaries and never deal with that uncle in my life. I don't think that's the answer Jesus has. You got to set some boundaries. Rather than use their personal pronouns, use their name. What's your name? What would you like me to call you? It's never wrong to call somebody by their name. Call them their name. Be gracious and be kind. Don't post, I'm never going to refer to somebody. That's just not helpful. Hold on to conviction, the truth of God's word. But be gracious and kind. Because here's what I know. The trans community is not more broken than you are. The trans community is not more broken than I am. They've not fallen farther than you have. All of us need the Holy Spirit to do surgery on us. The answer is not trans. The answer is transformation. The answer is Jesus Christ to follow Jesus. The gospels are only hope. It's to die to ourselves, Galatians 2.20 says, for I am crucified with Christ. I don't get to decide how God chooses to use me in this world. I've already given that up when I gave my life to Jesus. And so the answer through this entire series is not for a Democrat to become a Republican or a Republican to become a Democrat. It's not for a straight man to become a gay man or a gay to become straight. It's not to become pro-life or to pro-choice or vice versa. The goal is to present Jesus. People need Jesus. I, I want to just take a moment and thank the educators. I want to pray for the educators in the room. Your job is really, really important, and I empathize with what you're going through. Parents, you need to be on the front end of this conversation. You need to be having the conversation. If you haven't had it, begin today. Because somebody else is already having the conversation. Who you are is found in whose you are. Whose you are is found your identity. There's a creator who made you, created you, gave you your gender. It was very specific with that. Genders have equal value, different roles. 
I'm going to take a moment and pray. And would you pray with me? I want to pray for our parents in the room, our grandparents, uh, those of you who have friends or family members who are walking through this and you've come to me like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, that we would ask God for wisdom and grace. So Father, I thank you for the education system. I thank you for teachers who've given their life to advocate for children. I know teachers made a difference in my life and I, I pray that you'd give them great wisdom as they stand in front of that class and children look to them for answers. So give them discernment, give them wisdom and and, and only the way you can do would, would the gospel be present in that room. And I know not by clearly communicating the gospel, but being shrewd and being wise in how they treat their children. God, I pray for parents in the room that you would give them wisdom to have the conversation with their kids and to know when to have the conversation. It's not too early, it's not too late and just give them discernment and when to have that. God, help us to embrace our identity. May we not be led by our feelings. None of us feel like, most of us in the room don't feel like we're at home in our bodies most days. That's a reality. But the truth is, this is, this is what you've given us, and we trust you. What you're doing is, is good. So I pray for our parents. I pray for our new parents in the church who are just starting to raise children, and there's this message would not scare them, but it would, it would allow them to press in more and more to you. God, I pray that you would help Boulder Mountain be a safe place, a place of grace, that no matter where people are at, that they're welcome here. They're welcome to ask questions and explore and, and uh, come to us for help. May we all this week say, I see you. I empathize with you and I wanna help you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today, encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.